good evening students welcome to this first session which is kind of a webinar to interact with me and know a little bit whatever knowledge i have and i can share it with you so this topic uh, diagnostic tools of pathology i choose to discuss with you because whenever i go to take some exam or whenever we are taking some exam uh, for the students we frequently ask the questions which diagnostic modality to be used what is the test to be done and uh, we find that the students are not uh, like they are not confident enough to answer those questions so this session is basically to orient the mbbs students and uh, to some extent the interns to know how to apply these diagnostic tools that are available in pathology okay so with that we will start our session and uh, all medicos know there are different treatment modalities right like we have antibiotics we have chemotherapy we have medical therapy we have surgical therapy so all these therapies are available now how to decide which therapy is best for the patient right so whenever there is a that is a thought process the clinician goes through so we see the patient so there is a clinical information we get and then we suspect there is a certain disease first of all we suspect we cannot confirm okay and then to confirm that we need certain help from other medical sciences okay other medical streams or branches one is pathology the other is biochemistry and microbiology and third is radiology or imaging so overall all these specialties they help us to diagnose or confirm a disease first important thing is we need to have a diagnosis because as you all are aware that today is the time of evidence based medicine we can't give any therapy to any patient without having any evidence of the disease process or confirmation of the disease process okay so with this in the background we will go very slowly and we will be discussing the different modalities that are available but we will not be discussing in detail about each modality so you will just be knowing at the end of this session which modality is to be used okay so here i will not be talking anything about biochemistry microbiology and uh, radiology because i am a pathologist so we will be focusing only on the diagnostics uh, equipments or tools that are available in pathology so with that the learning objectives first we will know the different modalities that are available for the clinician second why these modalities are important because you need to know the advantage and the limitations of each modality which i will be discussing then the applications of each modality okay when to apply which one to apply first which one to apply second okay the sequence of application and all this we will try to know through case based scenarios it will not be a boring one i assure you you be interactive with me be with me and you will learn a lot about these tools so then we will go on to have a nice quiz or you can say i will ask you some questions and then i will give you a chance to ask me some questions so the branches or sub specialties in pathology by this time most students who have come to the subject of pathology will know there are some sub specialties like pathology is a specialty and there are certain sub specialties and one of them is hematology okay hematology is study of blood and blood related disorders then comes histopathology histopathology is study of tissue in which we take small biopsies or maybe a bigger resection specimens and we process it and see it under the microscope to diagnose any disease that is called as histopathology the third comes cytology now the name itself says that this is study of cells i will be going through how we can get these cells and how we do a study on them this is a cervical smear image then comes immunopathology now we know that there are certain immunological disorders like immunodeficiency disorders autoimmune disorders so these disorders are worked up or diagnosed with the help of immunopathology then comes molecular pathology which is a recent advance or you can say of late this molecular pathology has been attaining a lot of like you can say importance in as a diagnostic tool but we will not be talking in detail about it because here we are just trying to learn the application not the detail of each application 
now comes hematology okay so study of blood we know that and to study we will need certain instruments if you can recall whenever you people fall ill or any of us fall ill we go to a doctor the first thing doctor says is do a blood test all of you must be aware at least a blood test or urine test these are common routine basic tests that are done okay so this is a study of hematology and that gives us a lot of information now what are certain instruments that are used in hematology first i will show you some instruments then we will go to the application part okay now the basic test we do is a complete blood count complete blood count okay we need a lot of information like what is the total leukocyte count what is the differential count what is the eosinophil count what is the platelet count what is the uh, uh, red cell indices so all this information will come from complete blood count okay now once we have a complete blood count report if there is a abnormality or some abnormality is suspected then we can go for a peripheral smear in case there is a discordance between the machine report and the patient presentation or to look for parasites to look for the morphology of red cells we take the help of peripheral smear then comes your flow cytometer now what is flow cytometer it is a basically a machine which is used to diagnose and confirm leukemias as a mbbs student at least you do not know the intricacies you must know that there is a equipment called as flow cytometer and it is used for categorization and confirmation of leukemia which is otherwise in a layman's term called as blood cancer okay so those details of leukemias we will be talking in our subsequent portions but here you just know that flow cytometer is an equipment used for confirmation and categorization of leukemias and lymphomas then there is something called as high pressure liquid chromatography now once we have done the cbc we have done the peripheral smear we will have some doubt now the patient may be having a leukemia or the patient may be having a hemolytic disorder for leukemia flow cytometer is used for your hemolytic disorders or hemolytic anemia workup we will need a machine called as high pressure liquid chromatography or in short you can say hplc okay so this is the basis or these are some equipments that we used in hematology now with that we go to our first case scenario i will go very slowly just try to follow the clinical picture and you see how easily we can solve this case or how easily we can work up this case okay so here comes our first case a 6 year boy who presented with fever for two weeks duration physical examination showed anemia some puerperal spots along with sternal bone tenderness and generalized lymphadenopathy so you have to be very cautious when you are reading so what are the important points here that we have highlighted so here a 6 year old boy is what is the most likely diagnosis and what test would you do to arrive at a confirm diagnosis so what are the important features here this is a 6 year boy we know children can suffer from leukemias as well as children can suffer from hemolytic anemias patient has low grade fever okay fever now fever can indicate infection fever can be seen in malignancies two weeks tells you the short period of time or short duration physical examination patient has anemia now so anemia means there is a decrease in red cells some purpuric spots now you must know what are these purpuric spots these are some dark spots which happen on the skin because of thrombocytopenia so patient has anemia decrease in red cells patient has purpuric spots so there is a possibility of decrease in platelets along with that patient has sternal bone tenderness now the sternal bone tenderness could possibly because of marrow being expanded or marrow being infiltrated by some hemo you can say hematopoietic malignancy and generalized lymphadenopathy again indicates there could be infection or there could be a possibility of leukemic infiltration now with all that this is the clinical suspicion so how would a clinician progress to diagnose this case 
and this is a scenario that you will get in your MBBS as a case based question and you will have to write what are the investigations like here I have put it what test should be done to arrive or confirm the diagnosis okay so now this is a hematological case you have already got an idea so what are the hematological tests that we have to do first of all there is fever anemia and thrombocytopenia so we need to have a cbc okay a complete blood count as well as a peripheral smear now what will be the findings in each that we are not going to discuss first you must have an idea that whenever there is fever now fever can be because of leukemia fever can be from malaria also so that can easily be picked up from a peripheral smear okay so that is the importance of cbc and peripheral smear then comes hemolytic anemia if you do a peripheral smear you find there is changes of hemolytic anemia or the red cell indices are indicating hemolytic anemia then we do certain tests like sickling test as well as hplc in order to categorize into different types of hemolytic anemia now if the peripheral blood smear shows features of leukemia and once we know that the patient is suffering from leukemia we have to do certain tests in order to confirm that suspicion of leukemia and what is that from the peripheral smear we have doubted patient has leukemia or we can say leukemia but for further detailed workup or for doing a flow cytometry we have to do a bone marrow aspiration and a bone marrow biopsy depending on the indication bone marrow biopsy is not done in all cases but there are specific indications which you can cover in theory so in leukemias and lymphomas we need to do bone marrow aspiration as well as biopsy okay then once we have the material we have the bone marrow aspiration material we have the biopsy material on this material or on this smears we have to do some special tests that is special stains like pas is per iodic acid stiff mpo is myeloperoxidase okay just hear these names and when you are reading in detail your robin's textbook or your hersmon textbook you will be knowing more about these interpretations and then i told you there is something called as flow cytometer which is used for confirmation and typing of leukemia so when you are suspecting a hematological case the first thing that is work up is a hematological workup and this is how we progress with a hematological workup now this patient also had lymphadenopathy so for a lymphadenopathy what we can do is a fnac now fnac is fine needle aspiration cytology i will come to that in our subsequent slides okay now comes the second topic or you can say second sub specialty in pathology that is histopathology which is the study of tissue now to study the tissue first we need to obtain the tissue and what are the methods by which we can obtain the tissue it can be a small biopsy just you can see here this is a small bit of tissue taken from a suspicious area and it is processed that is called as a small biopsy first a small biopsy is done we will process it we will study it and if we say there is a malignancy then there will be a bigger biopsy or resection specimen now for example first if a patient is suspected of kidney tumor first a small biopsy or a core biopsy will be taken once the pathologist confirms that the core biopsy shows features of renal cell carcinoma then the whole kidney will be taken out and this whole kidney is called as a resection specimen so this is not just with kidney it can be with any system like say for example you can have a small biopsy of breast tissue if a malignancy is suspected and once in the small biopsy it is confirmed that there is a malignancy then a resection specimen or mastectomy specimen can be done and then the further staging and grading of tumor can be done and then we fix before processing of this tissue we fix them in formalin that you will be coming across in detail when you visit your respective pathology labs that was about processing then we take the help of some stains now histopathology is a sub specialty and under this sub specialty again you have certain tools like special stains in hematology i showed you pa stain the same pa stain also has some utility in histopathology 
then there is zn stain or zeal nielsen stain which is done for tuberculosis there is some pearl stain that is done for iron deposit now these are some basic stains i have told you there are n number of stains which you need not know in detail just know that there are some special stains which help us in confirmation of certain diseases then there is another ancillary technique that is immunohistochemistry now this is a, you can say a important very important tool for a histopathologist to confirm and categorize just like in flow cytometer used in in hematologist to confirm and categorize leukemias immunohistochemistry is a modality used in histopathology for confirmation and categorization of different types of malignancy now ck is cytokeratin lca is leukocyte common antigen and vimentin is a, a mesenchymal marker and you can read more about them from your textbook there is another modality that is available something called as frozen section okay so here we process the tissue in formalin for routine processing in frozen test section what we do we freeze the tissue the tissue will come to the pathology department where we freeze the tissue now this is called as a cryostat okay a cryostat inside which we have a cryo microtome okay the tissue the temperatures of this cryostat varies from minus 30 to minus 40 degrees and the details i am not going to discuss but what will be done the tissue will be immediately frozen and the sections can be cut here and what is the advantage of this frozen section we need it for kidney biopsy we need it for muscle biopsy as well as we need it for intra operative opinions now what is this intra operative opinion so you know that when the surgeon is operating now say there is a squamous cell carcinoma the surgeon will do a wide local excision and the surgeon would be interested to know whether all the margins are clear or some margin is still involved so in that case we pathologist will help them through this intraoperative or this cryostat we will freeze it we will take a frozen section we will do a rapid stain and we will inform them whether the margins are free or the margins are involved there is another modality called as immunofluorescence and it has an application in kidney biopsy as well as skin biopsy to see whether immunoglobulins or you can say antibodies are deposited in certain tissues so immuno means antibodies fluorescence means there will be some light effect so just remember immunofluorescence is utilized in kidney and skin biopsies which you will learn better when i show you the case scenario then comes electron microscope okay electron microscopy is an advanced technique not used for all kind of diseases and it is available in very limited setups so electron microscopy has maximum utility in kidney biopsies this is just for your knowledge but it has applications in many other pathology as well as microbiological investigations so we have these are some of the subspecialties like special stains immunohistochemistry frozen sections immunofluorescence as well as electron microscopy so please note down your doubts and we can discuss them in the end i will give you some time to ask your queries and i will be clearing them one by one so this is about histopathology now we will go to our second case scenario okay so here comes a 25 year old female who presented with brownish appearing urine with the decrease output so urine output is decreased there is brownish appearing color she gave history of similar episodes in the past similar episodes tells you that it is recurrent on evaluation the patient had malar rash oral ulcer pale conjunctiva and bilateral pedal edema now you must notice each of these clinical features see patient when they come to a clinician they will not tell you that i have this disease they will tell you the symptoms you have to appreciate the signs and then you have to do certain investigations in order to confirm the disease her blood pressure was 150 over 90 so she had hypertension her serum creatinine was below or you can sorry above 4 gram per deciliter so her serum creatinine was elevated 
now you will get a clinical scenario like this and some questions will be there like what is the clinical pathological condition how do you approach to diagnose such a case this approach is not just for learning for writing in the exam this approach is important for you to know so that in your day to day life you can do these tests and you can confirm certain diseases or you can evaluate different case scenarios or different patients now 25 year old female why have i highlighted this because certain diseases are more common in female certain diseases are more common in young female okay so that is why i have highlighted and you must take a note of this then comes brownish appearing urine so now this brown color is most likely because there is some hematuria and the altered blood can give you a brownish appearance decrease urine output shows that there is re decrease renal function similar episodes i have already told this is recurrent now malar rash oral ulcer what does that tell you this is very common in one autoimmune disorder that is in young females and that is can you name the autoimmune disorder which we have malar rash oral ulcers as well as discoid rash yes come on have a guess it is sle okay or systemic lupus erythematosus so from all these and that autoimmune disorders are common in young females so here we can suspect that this lady is probably suffering from some autoimmune disorder okay there is a pale conjunctiva the pale conjunctiva what does that tell you that the patient is having anemia bilateral pedal edema pedal edema tells you that that's this is likely to be hypoproteinemia or the kidney is excreting some proteins because of which there is edema in the tissue there is blood pressure 150 over 90 she has hypertension and serum creatinine is elevated so she has some evidence of renal failure which can also be made out from decrease output now what is the clinical pathological condition i would say most likely she is cover, suffering from a autoimmune disorder like sle now you have suspected how do you confirm this case you would have to take certain approach so let's see how the approach we can take so what is the work up we will do first we have because there is pale conjunctiva we know for any disease uh, we have to do a cbc and peripheral smear and patient has anemia so scbc and peripheral smear has to be done and here comes the utility of hematology okay see how hematology is useful here then there is oral ulcer and malar rash which is suspicious of sle so we can take the help of immunopathology where we can do a serology for ana and double stranded dna these are certain antibodies that are commonly positive in sle third comes decrease urine output and dark colored urine so that tells you that the patient is likely to have a kidney problem so urine examination becomes very important here and here comes the utility of clinical pathology where we do urine examination as a very important part of our workup the fourth is there is increased creatinine so there is proteinuria now proteinuria we have not yet tested but because he has edema we can think that there is hypoproteinemia and that could be because of proteinuria she has hypertension so proteinuria hypertension hematuria all this indicate that she is likely to be suffering from glomerulonephritis or you can say lupus nephritis so what do you have to do you have to do a kidney biopsy see there is a application of hematology there is a application of immunopathology there is the application of clinical pathology as well as there is a application of histopathology so we can't say in any specific case only one modality is to be used so these are different pathological modalities that can be used to work up any clinical scenario so what is the workflow in histopathology just for your understanding i will show you this is a kidney biopsy okay so for this patient first a kidney biopsy will be done and then this is h and e hematoxylin and eosin stain section okay for kidney biopsy we do hematoxylin and eosin and we observe it under a compound microscope this is the pa stain this is a special stain so you see the application this is a routine stain this is a special stain then comes 
the immunofluorescence what i told you for that we need a immunofluorescence microscope which is a different but you must know this is a compound microscope for routine viewing this is a immunofluorescence microscope for immunofluorescence studies and here where you can see how the kidney biopsy will look under the immunofluorescence microscope and then in the end if required we can take the help of electron microscopy to study different protocytic disorders as well as subepithelial subendothelial deposits so all those details you can follow up in the theory so this is the workflow in histopathology then comes another subspecialty that is cytology the study of cells now study of cells we need to study but how do you obtain the cells there are two methods like in histopathology we have small biopsy and resection here we have exfoliative cytology as well as fnst now exfoliative cytology is something where the cells are set now there are lining we know every epithelial surface some lining cells will be there and they have to turn over or they have to be shed so if there is a tumor in the peritoneal cavity then the shed cells will be shed into the acetic fluid and this acetic fluid can be studied that is called as exfoliative cytology similarly there is something called as cervical cytology or pap smear in pap smear what we do we take a little bit of brushing from the cervix and we study those cells which are normal or abnormal okay we try to so screen the patients whether they are having dysplasia or not and that is called as cervical cytology which is another type of exfoliative cytology okay it is a passive thing where the cells are shed we just brush them obtain these cells and we do a study the other is a more cumbersome and you can say it is fine needle aspiration cytology in this it is a little more invasive where we will use a needle and a syringe so you see here this is exfoliative cytology this patient has ascites and we can tap the ascetic fluid and we can subject it for cytological testing so these fluids are of different color and these fluids will be centrifuged and smears will be made from the smear we can diagnose whether the patient is having tuberculosis whether the patient is having lymphoma or the patient is having a carcinoma next comes another type of exfoliative cytology that is pap smear or cervical smear so as you can make out this is a image of a cervix where it is little indurated area is there okay little indurated area is there so what can we do we can take a brush okay these are different type of materials that are used this is a ir spatula and this is a cyto brush okay so this brush can be taken we will wrap it here and then the cells can be transferred either to a fluid in liquid pa in liquid based cytology or they can be transferred into a smear that is a conventional smear so this brush is used for liquid based cytology whereas ir spatula is used for conventional cytology and then what we will do we will stain these smears and we will see whether there is any dysplasia any abnormality or does the patient need any attention then comes fine needle aspiration cytology in short it is called as fnac okay you must remember fine needle aspiration cytology here we use a handle a syringe and a needle now you see this patient has a swelling on the cheek now this swelling can be anything it can be tuberculosis it can be lymphoma it can be sarcoma it can be anything and how do we know that so what we will do we will put the needle take out some cells and then we will make a smear if it shows granuloma then we will diagnose it as tuberculosis now why diagnosis is important because if we put a diagnosis of tuberculosis then the patient will be given att no surgery it will be given anti tubercular therapy same case if a pathologist will report as lymphoma now this is the morphology of a lymphoma if it is reported as lymphoma again no surgery but chemotherapy will be given okay same thing if it turns out to be a sarcoma then what will be given surgery or surgical treatment will be recommended for the patient so here you can make out how the pathologist is helping to make a final diagnosis and how the final diagnosis is helping to decide the specific type of therapy that is the importance of pathology so we go to our case scenario number 3 so here comes a 55 year old male 
chronic smoker who presented with a slowly progressive breathlessness cough blood tinged sputum for 3 months now i will come into the discussion just read out the history on examination he was found to have left pleural effusion on the and the left supraclavicular lymphadenopathy the ct scan of chest showed a irregular infiltrative mass in the lower part of left upper lobe so now you will have a question with it what is the clinical pathological diagnosis how would you approach to diagnose such a case now based on the clinical history you can suspect but you have to do certain pathological investigations in order to confirm so let's read out the clinical history again 55 now age is important i told you because certain diseases happen at certain age now male male will suffer from certain diseases and chronic smoker now we know that smoking is a predisposing factor for many pathological conditions like malignancies as well as the predisposed to tuberculosis and infections presented with slowly progressive so it is a chronic disease now breathlessness cough blood tin sputum what does they tell you they tell you that the patient is having a problem with the respiratory system blood tin sputum can be appreciated in malignancy as well as it can be seen in tuberculosis so we still don't know what the patient is suffering from on examination he is found to have pleural effusion so he is having a growth on the left side or a mass infiltrative mass on the left side and pleural effusion is on the left side now this pleural effusion can be because of tuberculosis pleural effusion can be again because of malignancy so again this doesn't help us there is a supraclavicular lymphadenopathy so again lymph node can be involved in malignancy lymph node can be involved in tuberculosis the ct scan showed a irregular infiltrative mass in the lower part of the upper lobe now this helps us a little bit because we know tuberculosis mostly involves the upper lobe whereas infiltrative mass in the in the lower lobe will mostly be a favoring a feature of malignancy and tuberculosis mostly presents with the cavitatory lesion but it can present in different forms so you have to be careful so the clinical pathological diagnosis is that the patient is most likely suffering from a lung disease and it could be tuberculosis or malignancy you can write your differential both of them here and how do you approach to diagnose a case that is most important remember if you write this as malignancy then you are also correct if you write this as tuberculosis you are also partially correct so how will we work up this case now patient has sputum so see the utility now here what are the different modalities we are using patient has sputum so cytology can be a modality the sputum can be subjected to cytology <clears throat> the patient has lymphadenopathy supraclavicular lymphadenopathy so what can be done a fnsc can be done or a biopsy can be done from the supraclavicular lymphadenopathy now you may ask me which is the preferred method i would go for fnsc because it is a easier less cumbersome procedure i will talk about that in detail same patient also has pleural effusion so i showed you how acetic fluid can be tapped similarly your pleural fluid can also be tapped and subjected for cytological evaluation and remember i told you that histopathology we use a modality that is called as immunohistochemistry in order to confirm and categorize the carcinomas or different malignancies because the therapy for different malignancy is different so we can use take the help of immunohistochemistry which can be used on histopathology sample as well as immunohistochemistry can be performed on cytology samples also in addition to that if required if required we can do a molecular testing on the cytology sample or on the biopsy sample which we have obtained from pleural effusion or whatever we have obtained from the lymphadenopathy the important thing is for molecular testing we need to have the tumor cells so that these tumor cells can be categorized into different molecular subtypes so that is how we work up a case in relation to cytology but again i would like to stress that it is not that one form of modality is used we usually use multimodality for each diagnosis 
So the last case scenario, it's a 46 year old female who presented to gyne OPD. I hope you people have got the answer by now by seeing this picture. This is the same cervical image that I had put it previously. So presented with a history of abnormal vaginal bleeding. And typical history is post -coital. Now I will come to that later, notice since four months. On speculum examination, she had a small ulcerated bar indurated area in the external os and she gave history of being a chronic smoker with multiple sex partners. Now each and every point here is important, please note them carefully. On USG, she had mild ascites. How would you proceed with the evaluation of such a case? So let's go through it again. 46. I told that age is important. 46 is because this is a perimenopausal age group when carcinoma cervix is very important or gynecological disorders are common in this age group. Okay. She has vaginal bleeding, specifically postcoital, which is very specific for carcinoma cervix. Once a patient gives history of postcoital bleed, you have to suspect that there is a chance of a carcinoma cervix. She has a small ulcerated indurated area, so that could be a, a dysplastic area or that could be an infiltrative area. Now, there is certain history that is also important. She is a chronic smoker. Now, I told you smoking is a predisposing factor for many of the malignancies. In addition to that, she has multiple sexual partners. That is also important because we know HPV is one of the factors of carcinoma cervix and HPV is transmitted through multiple sexual partners. She also had a mild ascites which was appreciated on ultrasonography. Now how would we approach this case? First, whenever there is abnormal uterine bleeding, we have to go ahead with cervical smear or that is otherwise called as pap smear. Remember. <clears throat> The pap smear is a screening method, it is not a confirmatory method, but if you can diagnose a malignancy early or you can say you can pick up the abnormality early, then the treatment can be given early and patient can be saved from fatal consequences. So the next comes a cervical biopsy. Now this is a screening method, biopsy is a confirmatory method. We screen and if we say there is dysplasia, then what will be done? A biopsy will be taken. And also, a endometrial curatings can be done if the patient presents with menorrhagia. Because menorrhagia is always indicative of endometrial pathology, whereas postcoital bleed is indicative of cervical pathology. In addition to that, this patient also had ascites, so you can tap the fluid and send this for fluid cytology. That is how you work up a case. Okay? So now, you must be wondering what is FNSE? and biopsy in both the methods we can obtain tissue but what is the advantage of FNSE over biopsy so for FNSE you may be asked a MCQ or you may be asked in your viva relating to how FNSE is different from biopsy or which modality is to be used first which is a easier modality which is a better method so please understand try to understand this okay so FNSE is mostly performed by pathologist but can be performed by the clinician and radiologist whereas biopsy is performed by the clinicians as well as radiologist now FNSE is invasive but here we used a very thin bone needle, a 25 gauze needle, okay, 23 to 25 gauze needle. So it is less painful, but biopsy is taken through a bigger bone needle and that is why it is more in invasive and a small incision has to be given for biopsy. Now accessibility, because we are putting a small needle, we can go to any site with minimal trauma, whereas biopsy can be risky at deeper sites as well as thyroid and salivary gland. Remember, these are two sites where biopsy is not recommended and FNSE is the first and preferred modality, especially in thyroid and salivary gland. We talk about anesthesia. In biopsy, anesthesia will be required. It may be local or it may be systemic, whereas in FNSE, whenever we are doing a superficial FNSEs, on most occasions, no sedation or no anesthesia is required. Then there is something called as on-site evaluation. Now, when we do a biopsy or FNSE, we need to know whether their material or representative material has been obtained or not obtained. And that is possible in FNSE, we can do a rapid on-site evaluation, but in biopsy, on most occasions, that is not feasible. 
in fnse we can do multiple passes because we are just putting a small needle so if there is a big lesion we can put the needle in three to four areas and have multiple sampling whereas in biopsy there is limitation we cannot poke the needle in multiple sites what about the turnaround time in fnse we get the result in the same day or rather you can say within few hours we can have the result okay whereas a biopsy processing and to get the report it takes a minimum of two to three uh, days depending on the type of biopsy if it is a bony biopsy it may take longer whereas a soft tissue biopsy may be processed within two to three days and all this method both FNSE and biopsy what we can do we can obtain material for microbiological test also now we have done FNSE we found some pus so this pus can easily be subjected to microbiological testing if we do a biopsy and we find that there is necrotic tissue this necrotic tissue can also be sent for microbiological testing and that is how biopsy and FNSE are helpful and we can perform all the special stains which you will know in detail when you go through pathology subject and that can be applied on FNSE material as well as biopsy material. The, now we have completed a hematology, we have completed histopathology and we have completed cytopathology. And I will just take you through the other subspecialties like immunopathology. I have already told that immunopathology is a branch where it almost deals with all autoimmune disorders, your workup for immunodeficiency disorder, as well as transplantation workup, which is HLA typing and cross matching. In molecular pathology, this is not very important from an undergraduate point of view, but you just know the names that in molecular pathology, there is something called as fish fluorescence in situ hybridization, there is PCR, there is sequencing. So these are some of the methods and interested people can read detail about them. In clinical pathology, I've already told you, we have urine analysis. See, most of the times during your exams or during your practical demonstration, we show you urine test through dipstick method or we show you urine testing through your Benedict's and all those tests. But actually in real life, we don't do those methods. We in the labs, we have urine analyzers, just like we have blood or hematology analyzers. In clinical pathology lab, we have urine analyzers, which can be used to determine all information about urine. Then we have semen analyzers, mostly used in case of infertility and reproductive pathology. We can also have stool analysis as a part of clinical pathology. So this is little bit about molecular pathology and clinical pathology. So with that, we have come almost to the end of our session. Now it is quiz time and I have the right to ask you some questions because I have taught you for say uh, 40 minutes. Now you have to answer some of these questions. And if you haven't yet understood them, then I will take up some questions and clarify your doubts. So let's go ahead with our questions and you have to make an attempt to answer them. Okay, I will give a pause for one second and you just think of the answer that will be fitting for this thing. So I will be telling you the clinical presentation and you will have to suggest the modality that is best fitting. Okay, so what modality to be used first? Now, a 16 year female with a breast lump. So age is given and mobility is given breast lump. So in a 16 year female, do you suspect carcinoma? No. In a 16 year female, we suspect most common breast lump is fibroadenoma. So what modality is to be used? Have you guessed the answer? The best modality is fine needle aspiration cytology. Okay. Then comes the next question. A 37 year female with thyroid swelling. Okay. 37 female thyroid. We know endocrine pathology is more common in females. So this thyroid swelling could be because of inflammation. Thyroid swelling could be because of goiter. Thyroid swelling could be because of your thyroid tumors like papillary carcinoma and follicular carcinoma. So which modality should be used first? Shall we use a biopsy? I have already told you that biopsy is usually not advised in thyroid and salivary gland. So which modality shall be used? Yes, you are correct. So we can use a fine needle aspiration cytology again. Okay, so here comes the third question. 54 year old smoker and alcoholic with gastric ulcer. 
Now, 54 is a little middle aged to elderly male smoking. We know smoking causes gastritis, alcohol causes gastritis, as well as smoking and alcohol can cause gastric carcinoma. So, this patient has an ulcer. Now, this ulcer could be a benign ulcer or could be a malignant ulcer. So, what modality can we use here? Can we use a FNAC here? Can we use a FNAC here? No, we cannot use a FNAC here. So, we have to go for biopsy. A endoscopy has to be done and a biopsy has to be taken. Small biopsy. This is an incisional biopsy. Then comes a 45 year old female with thrombocytopenia. Okay. Thrombocytopenia means decreased platelets. Now, this decreased platelets has many causes. And how can we ascertain the cause? Shall we do a FNAC? Shall we do a biopsy? Do you think that FNAC and biopsy will help? because we are dealing with a hematological disorder. So which modality will help? We have to go for a bone marrow study. Okay. First, we will do a peripheral smear and then we will go for a bone marrow aspiration biopsy study. Comes a 45 year old female with nipple discharge. Is a fluid coming out of the nipple? So she's 45. So what modality shall we use? Shall we use a FNAC? She doesn't have a lump. Shall we use a biopsy? She doesn't have a lesion. She just has discharge. So what modality shall we do? We will have another psychological modality that is imprint smear. Now this discharge, we can just touch the slide and make a smear, and on that smear we can stain and then we can report it. Then comes a 19-year-old male with left supraclavicular lymphadenopathy. I have already told you in our case scenario that supraclavicular lymphadenopathy is there means which modality to be used first, biopsy or FNSE? Come on, yes, which modality to be used, which is a easier, which is a safer, which is a faster turnaround time? Yes, first should be FNSE and if you need more tissue, you can take a biopsy. Then we move on to the other one that is intraoperative pathological diagnosis. I have already told you intra-pathological diagnosis, which modality is to be used? Can we use the FNSE? Can we use the bone marrow study? No, we have to use a biopsy or that is a part of histopathology that is frozen section and we take the help of which machine did I show you for frozen section? Do you remember the machine that I showed you for frozen section? Yes, it is a cryostat. Now, the next question, it's a 23 year old male with hematuria and dysmorphic RBCs in urine. Now 23 male, young male, young chap, hematuria. So there is blood in urine, there is dysmorphic RBCs. So blood and dysmorphic RBCs indicate the patient is having glomerulonephritis or the problem lies in the glomeruli. Okay, so what shall we do? We have already done the urine test. We have seen there is a problem. So the next should be, can we do a FNSE? No, we cannot do a FNSE. The best modality here is a biopsy. So we must go for a kidney biopsy. Then we will go through some other questions. Like let's see a 63 year old male with pigmented skin lesion. Now he's an elderly male, pigmented skin lesion. The pigmented means it can be melanoma, it can be seborrheic keratosis. So how will you know what is this pigmented lesion, whether it is a nevus, nevus is benign, melanoma is malignant. How will you know which modality to be used? Can we use the FNSE? Can we use the imprint smear? No. So we have to use a skin biopsy and this is modality under histopathology. A 60 year male with jaundice. Now jaundice tells that there is a problem with the liver. So, and 60 year age is another factor. We know that in 60 year male, the most common cause of jaundice is obstructive jaundice. And where does this obstruction occur? This obstruction occurs in the head of pancreas. So which modality can be used? We can do a FNSE or biopsy from the pancreatic mass. And then we can confirm whether that is an inflammatory lesion or that is a pancreatic carcinoma. Next one scenario is five year male with atypical lymphoid cells in peripheral smear. So he is suspected of a hematological problem. There are atypical lymphoid cells in peripheral smear. So which modality has to be done? Now there are atypical cells. What does atypical cells tells you? That patient is likelihood of having a leukemia. Now for leukemia categorization and typing, which modality has to be done? A bone marrow study. 
So bone marrow aspiration and biopsy, as well as which equipment is to be used? Yes, a flow cytometer has to be used in order to categorize. The fourth is a 50 year female with postcoital bleed from vagina. I have already discussed this. So what modality we will use as a screening method? The first modality, remember the first. So first we will go for a cervical smear. Now cervical smear is a screening method. If cervical smear turns out to be abnormal, then we can go ahead with a biopsy. Now a 50 year old male with a swelling in the hard palate. So there is a growth in the hard palate. So which modality is to be used? Which is a easier modality? The easier modality is FNSE because if you do a biopsy, there is a chance it might bleed and it might have, have to be sutured unless this has to be applied and it is more invasive. So FNSE is an easier method. But if FNSE does not help, then we can resort to a biopsy. Then comes the next question that is a 60 year old male with history of lung carcinoma and pancytopenia. Now already the answer is evident. So here there is history of lung carcinoma. So there could be a metastasis to marrow or there could be a pancytopenia which has no relation to lung carcinoma. It could be just plastic anemia. So how will we know that? We have to do a bone marrow aspiration and biopsy which will be helpful in knowing the pathology that is happening in the bone marrow space. Then comes a 24 year old male with headache, confusion and the neck rigidity. Now if you see this is a young male, if you see headache, confusion and neck rigidity, this has something to do with the central nervous system. Okay, so if it is with the central nervous system, which sample can we obtain for a study? We can obtain a CSF sample, okay? And CSF sample can be subjected to cytology, can be subjected to microbiology to see if there is infections, as well as CSF sample can be subjected to biochemistry in order to know the sugar levels as well as the protein levels. And all this data is put together to come to a diagnosis of meningitis. Okay, so we have gone through certain questions and then you have done pretty well. Let's see what we can summarize or how we can summarize. Okay, so I hope you have you remember all the diagnostic modalities. So there are a range of diagnostic modalities. Okay, the specialties are histopathology, cytology, hematology, immunopathology and under each specialty there will be again some subspecialties or diagnostic modality. As a clinician, one must be aware which modality is to be used in which disease condition. Now, if there is a liver pathology, then the liver function test, liver biopsy has to be done. If the patient is suspected to have a kidney pathology, then urine examination and kidney biopsy has to be done. If the patient is suspected of gastrointestinal tract pathology, endoscopy has to be done and a biopsy has to be taken. The order in which the modalities are to be used, like I said, first we can use a screening method, later on we can resort to biopsy if required because biopsy is a more invasive method. Last but not the least, you must know the advantages and limitations of each modality so that one modality fails, you can resort to the second modality. And you have to put in all information, I am not just saying that it is the pathological information which is important because i am a pathologist i have spoken about only the pathological modalities but as a clinician uh, the one has to put together the pathological information the microbiological information the radiological information as well as the biochemical information i input together we can have the final diagnosis and once the final diagnosis is done the definite treatment or definite therapy can be given to the patient so with that, we, we have come to the end of this session. Now I am ready to take some questions, if there are some questions from your side. Mr. Gaurav, is there any questions on the chat box? Can we take some questions, please? Sir, uh, there aren't many questions on the chat box. In fact, the, the session was a uh, very well and self-explanatory uh, session. However, there is only one question and the user is anonymous. So this uh, question is, could you tell us some condition where imprint smear is used? 
I gave just one example. Imprint smears are useful in ulcerated lesions. Okay, ulcerated lesion. Now suppose a patient has an ulcer on the skin. You want to know whether it is an infective ulcer or it is a neoplastic ulcer. Okay. Now infections are so many types. You can take an imprint smear. Like I said, there is a nipple discharge. You can take an imprint smear. If there is an oral ulcer. Nowadays, biopsy is easily visible, available, but in previous days or say uh, 20 years back or in centers where biopsy is not available, even imprint smears can be taken from oral, oral ulcers and you can categorize them into benign as well as malignant. So that is how imprint cytology can help. Anyone wants to ask a question, can we unmute? If somebody raises a hand, can we unmute and take uh, one or two questions, Mr. Gaurav, if it is possible? Yeah, sure, sir. If there are uh, any questions, people can raise their hands. Please. Seems the ses session is well explanatory, sir. And there aren't many questions. However, there's one more question. Talk about USG guideline aspiration. Okay. Now, I did not go to the detail of ultrasound guided aspirations because uh, those things are little complicated and not much of uh, useful for a MBBS or intern level thing. But uh, FNSCs are two types. One is a superficial which we palpate and do. For that we don't need. Suppose I have a thyroid lump which is visible, which is palpable. I can easily do it without guidance. Okay. But suppose I have a, a lesion uh, which is not visible, which is not clinically palpable, then I have to take the help of radiology or ultrasound. Similarly, if a breast lump is easily visible or you can say easily felt, we can palpate and do a FNSE from that. But if a breast lump is not easily visible, then we can take the help of ultrasound. So there are many radiological methods and nowadays cytology is improving. We have endobronchial ultrasound guide FNSE. We have EBUS that is end endotracheal uh, ultrasound guided FNSE. So there are many modalities of FNSE which we can use to sample visceral FNSEs. Like suppose a patient has a liver mass. Now liver mass, I cannot put the needle without seeing where is the lesion, right? So we have to do an ultrasound, see where is the lesion and under the probe or under the guidance, we have to put the needle into the lesion and obtain some material. That is where your guided FNSE or ultrasound or radiology guided FNSE will come into play. So there's one more question. Could you tell the particular feature of lupus nephritis? See, this session is not to discuss the morphological features. Now, lupus nephritis varies in different six clinical stages. There is a class one lupus, there is a class two lupus, and all these lupus will have different morphology. But we are discussing which modality to be used. Whenever you are suspecting a lupus nephritis, you have to do a urine examination, you have to do serological examination, as well as you have to do a kidney biopsy. And as a pathologist, I will need those information also when I'm interpreting the biopsy. So the lupus classes or stages of lupus nephritis, depending on different morphology, we categorize them into category one or you can say class one, class two, class three. So those details you can read from the textbook and you can find out, please. There's another question, sir, from Thara C. If the patient is in grade three liver disease and it is contradicted, to take the liver biopsy, what should we do? See, certain diseases we don't like, say, uh, end-stage liver disease, end-stage kidney disease. Whenever there is an end-stage disease, if we take a biopsy, it will show you only fibrosis, only sclerosis, and it will not show you a definite pathology, right? So end-stage liver disease is cirrhosis, end-stage kidney disease is like CKD, okay? So if you take a biopsy from a cirrhosis, now we can say that the liver is cirrhotic. But I cannot say whether it is cirrhosis because of hepatitis, it is cirrhotic because of hemochromatosis, it is cirrhotic because of some other predisposing factors, say autoimmune liver disease. So in taking a liver biopsy in the end stage is not much helpful, but we take liver biopsies in order if we can get some information, it is good. If we can't get information, that is not helpful. Okay, but we can also do certain serological and blood functions like liver function test, there is a list of liver function tests which we can do to see whether the liver is still in functional state or the liver has gone into a end stage liver disease. Once those functional, similarly in the kidney, we do 
we do certain uh, functionality tests for kidney if those functionality tests are severely abnormal then we say that the patient is having ckd or chronic kidney disease end stage kidney disease and we may not do a biopsy in those conditions